Thank you, choir and congregation and praise team, all for preparing our hearts and leading us in worship this morning. I ask you to turn in your Bibles again to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to continue a series. In fact, we'll be looking at the life of David for many, many weeks to come. And we're going to continue this series, Seeking the Heart of God, by addressing the second part of what it means to discern God's plan and God's will for your life. Now, even though I feel certain that we are just about at a solution, we, we've come to some resolve, I think, on this matter, my wife and I, the last few weeks have just been dreadful as we have been trying to plan and figure out a vacation. Sometimes planning a vacation can be a, a burden itself that needs a vacation, right? You spend so much time trying to think about where you're going to go and find reservations and things to do and and arrive at the destination and be there and hurry and rush from place to place. Taking a vacation can wear you out. But I'm the kind of guy that would be perfectly fine without a plan at all. I mean, really, I would be fine saying to my wife and kids, pack up your clothes, get in the car, we're going to leave. And if they said, where are we going? I could say, I don't know. I don't have a plan. I don't have a clue. I would be fine with that. My wife would not. She would melt down. She would fall, you know, to the floor and, and she just wouldn't know what to do. But, you know, it, it really is kind of absurd when you think about it. Imagine if someone said to you, grab your things, get in the car, we're going to go. You say, where are we going? And they say, we don't know. Well, how long is it going to take? And they say, we don't know. And you say, well, what path are we going to take to get there? And they say, we don't know. I mean, that sounds kind of absurd, doesn't it? Nobody travels that way. No sense of direction, no plan, no path. But sadly, I think that a lot of Christians live their Christian lives in that very same way. You really don't know what God's purpose or plan for your life is. You don't know ultimately the things that God has equipped you and prepared you to do because you've never explored those options. You don't sort of have a, a vision or a goal for what God wants to do in your life or in the life of your family. You just kind of wake up day to day and say, okay, whatever, wherever we end up, however we get there, whatever direction we take is fine. Many Christians live their lives like that and then wonder why after decades in church they feel like they haven't grown or moved or accomplished anything in their Christian lives. There's something disappointing, disheartening, and even discouraging about the thought of wandering aimlessly with no real sense of purpose. There's no fulfillment in that. There's no satisfaction in that. But how many Christians live that way for decades, for many, many years without knowing God's purpose? Last week we were introduced to David. We know him as the king of Israel. We know him as the, the great psalmist. We know him as the giant slayer. But when we were introduced to him last week, he's not yet any of those things. He's an unknown factor, almost a complete unknown at this point. Not even invited to worship with his dad and his brothers and the visiting preacher, Samuel, when he comes to town. He's just a shepherd boy out in the fields. And we only got through the first part of this last week in verse 1. What I tried to point out to you and establish is that every one of us has to realize, we have to come to terms with this reality that God does indeed have an overarching purpose and plan for our lives. We don't always see it. In many cases, we certainly don't live according to it. He doesn't ask our permission for it, and sometimes He doesn't tell us exactly what He's doing. But there is plenty of evidence from the scriptures that the very same sovereign God who created you, who knows you inside and out, who knows every breath you take, who knows every hair on your head, who knows everything about your life, he really does have a plan for you. He wants you to discern what that plan is and explore 
through his word and by his spirit and through the body of Christ exactly what that plan is and where it will take you and where you will go so that you can live with a sense of purpose. That plan begins, as we said last week, with your personal salvation in Jesus Christ. It starts there with being born again. And from that point forward, God begins to open up for us a whole new sense of purpose and design and fulfillment in life. But what about beyond that? We pointed out last week in verses 5 and 6 and 7 of this passage that prioritizing personal sanctification is an important part of this. Prioritizing personal sanctification is a very important part of this because remember the truth of verse 7? See, let, let's, let's read the passage down to verse 7 so that we can set the context. And then I want to remind you of this important truth of verse 7 that has to do with your heart and the formation of your heart. Back in verse 1, the Lord speaks to Samuel. Samuel is his prophet. Samuel is his preacher. Samuel is the judge. He's the religious leader. And the Lord says, how long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I've provided for myself a king among his sons. There's God's plan. There's the aspect of it that he's revealing to Samuel. Get over Saul. Fill your horn with oil. Get up and go. I've got a new king and you're going to find him among Jesse's sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves, which is, by the way, a call to holiness. Set yourself apart for this. And come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they came, verse 6, Samuel looked on Eliab. Eliab is one of Saul's, uh, uh, Jesse's sons, rather. Probably the oldest, almost certainly the best looking, outwardly the most obvious choice. And so he brings Eliab before the prophet. Samuel is fooled into thinking that this is the Lord's anointed based solely on external appearances. Israel had already made this mistake once. They had called Saul to be their king, and he turned out to be a great disappointment. They had judged Saul to be worthy of the kingship because of his appearance, because he was head and shoulders taller than the rest, and because he was handsome and from the right tribe, and, and he had all the right externalities. But God corrects Samuel's thinking in verse 7. The Lord says to him, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Please remember that truth and underline it. It deserves emphasis. It's worthy of your consideration. It reminds us of why, if we're ever going to be seekers of God's heart, we have to prioritize personal holiness. We have to prioritize personal sanctification. Because God is interested in our hearts. He's interested in the changing of our hearts, not our externalities. We tend to judge people wrongly when we judge only by external features. I got to go out yesterday and hang out with some of our young guys. We went and saw a movie, and uh, afterwards we went to the comic book store together. It's one of my favorite places. You won't find me in the bars and honky-tonks, but you might find me at a comic book shop. And we go into the shop, and as we enter into the shop, immediately I spot someone that I knew. And I go over, and I was like, hey, man, I said his name, gave him a high five. We start talking and stuff. This is a big, big guy. 
I mean, he's a big, broad-shouldered guy. He's got on a tank top, a muscle shirt. He's got tattoos from here all the way down to here. His legs are covered with tattoos. He's got piercings in his face, hair down to his shoulders. I go over and I'm talking to him. He's asking, I used to work with him, see? And he's excited when I tell him that I'm moving back to northern Kentucky and he's happy for me and he's rejoicing. And, and he starts talking about how things have changed a little bit in his life. I can't give you a lot of details, but you know what he does for a living? He protects children through a government agency and investigates to make sure that they're put in good homes. He's a good-hearted, kind, gentle guy. You wouldn't know it from looking at him. If he walked through the back doors this morning with his shorts and his tank top and his tattoos, you might immediately think, oh, we better keep our distance from this one. Watch out for him. He could be trouble. Another man could walk in in a suit and a tie and his hair fixed perfectly and his face clean shaven and we would think, oh, now there's one of ours. We'll sit him right here in the front. When the truth is, we can't see what's in the heart. And it may turn out that the one in the suit and the tie is a scoundrel and he may be here to uh, manipulate and take and do wrong and harm to someone and the last one that you would think would be here for good might just turn out to be the kindest, gentlest person you've ever met. We judge by externals. God looks at the heart. And because God's focus is on the inward appearance and the heart, it is important that we be people who are concerned about the development, the formation, the conformity of our hearts to the heart of Christ. God has... We read in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, already predetermined that those who are born again will be conformed to the image of Christ. Now that's not just eschatological. In other words, that's not just something that happens in the end time at the resurrection. That is a statement about our present sanctification. Our ongoing sanctification. God has already determined that He is interested in molding and shaping and conforming your heart to the image of Christ. That means by the Spirit and by the Word, God may be at work today rooting out some secret sin in your life. He may be convicting you and weighing heavily upon you about some secret hidden area of your life that is hindering you from growing and conforming to the image of Christ. God may be speaking to your heart today about love for your neighbor. And He may be convicting you about some wrongs that you have done towards another person. Those are all a part of the important process of God molding and shaping and conforming our hearts. That's why sanctification is so important. It's not only important because when you are growing closer to God and when you are allowing your heart to be formed into the image of Christ, when you are abandoning sin and turning from sin and drawing nearer to God, you will discern what His plan is for your life. That's one thing. But also when you know what His plan is for your life, prioritizing personal sanctification keeps you on that trajectory of doing what God has created and designed you to do. So by pursuing holiness and by being concerned about the formation of our hearts and by growing closer to Christ, we both learn and know the will of God for our lives and we continue in it. And we see in verse 5 the way that consecration Ritual cleansing was important. Setting individuals apart for worship was important. But more importantly in verse 7 is the issue of the heart. Now let's read on. I want to finish the passage this morning. We realize God's purpose and plan. We prioritize personal sanctification. But let me say thirdly, we must never minimize what God can do with us right where we're at. Then Jesse called Abinadab, this is another son, and he made him pass before Samuel. And he said, no, this isn't the one either. The Lord hasn't chosen this one. Verse 9, then Jesse made Shema pass by. I love these names, right? Eliab, Abinadab, Shema. Anybody having a baby? You want an Abinadab in your family or a Shema? I didn't think so. 
But these are three of the sons. And look at verse 10. Jesse does this with all seven of his sons. He passes them all before Samuel. Now there's a problem. Because God had already told Samuel it's going to be one of Jesse's boys. One of Jesse's boys is going to be the next king. And here's Samuel and he's looking each of them over. And he looks at this one and he's, and he's sturdy and he's strong and he's good looking and he's got good hair and he's dressed nice. And he, Samuel kind of looks up and says, maybe this one, Lord. The Lord says, nope, that's not the one. The next one comes by. Samuel says, well, this one's not quite as good looking, but you know, he's handsome and he'll do. And well, he's not quite as strong, but how about this one? The Lord says, uh-uh, not that one. And he goes to the next one. He says, well, this one's getting kind of scrawny, Lord, but maybe he's the one. And the Lord says, nope, it's not that one either. Verse 10 says this happened seven times. And Samuel, knowing what he had heard from God, turns to Jesse and says, the Lord has not chosen one of these. Verse 11, he asks the question then, is this all you got? Are all your sons here? Have you really brought all of them in? And notice this, just emphasizing the fact that as humans, we judge on externals. Even David's own dad didn't think he would be the one. Didn't even invite him to the meal. He wasn't even there. And so Jesse responds and says, well, I've still got this one boy. He's the youngest, but you don't want him. He's just out in the fields tending sheep. Behold, he's keeping the sheep. Samuel says to Jesse, Send and get him. We will not sit down till he comes here. <laughs> I went to a wedding the other night where we had to wait like an hour before, you know, the food was all set up in the middle and, and I'm there and I'm sitting at the table in the ceremony and I was hungry and I wanted to eat, but nobody could eat till the bride and the groom came in. You know, well, imagine this. Samuel says, we ain't eating, we're not feasting until somebody runs all the way out into the fields and gets that boy and brings him back here because that's the one that I want to see. The one that all of you have overlooked. That's the one we need. No doubt Jesse sends a servant out to the field, look in verse 12, to get this youngest boy and bring him in the youngest boy was ruddy. We don't use the word ruddy. Even Hebrew scholars aren't exactly sure what it means. It has something to do with red. It could mean a reddish hair or maybe red cheeks. Maybe this was a reference to his youthfulness. We don't know. But this boy is brought in and he's ruddy. He's got beautiful eyes and he's handsome. But he's still the last, the youngest one, the one who's out tending sheep. And Yahweh, the Lord, speaks to Samuel and says, This is the one, Samuel. Arise and anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel takes the horn of oil, and notice this. This is a sign of the energizing power of the Holy Spirit. And he anoints him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. What was David doing while his brothers were being considered? One by one, they pass by. They present themselves, each of them hopeful that they're going to get the big promotion here. What's David doing all this time? He's out in the field. He's tending sheep. He's just a boy, probably a teenager of maybe 13 or 14 years old. And he's out in the fields with sheep. Sheep stink. And sheep are really dumb animals. They're very difficult to lead, so I'm told. I'm no shepherd, but I've read that they're very difficult to lead. They're defenseless. They have no natural defenses, right? Sheep are one of the few animals I'm really not afraid of. I can walk right up to them. I can bully a sheep because he's not going to do anything, you know? Just going to look at, I mean, they don't do anything. They're defenseless. They're going to rub you to death with his wool. I mean, they can't do anything. And they stink. And, and, and David's out there in the field. And he's laying down his life protecting these, these sheep. And he's, and he's guiding them every day. The same David who would pin the 23rd Psalm. About leading the sheep to still waters. Leading them to green pastures. 
protecting them with his rod and his staff, going before them and, and preparing a table before them, even in the presence of his enemies. The same David who would pin those words day and night, day and night, day and night. He's out in the fields keeping sheep. And listen, all the while, what he doesn't know is that God is using the ordinary daily experiences of life to prepare him for something great that God has in store for this young, overlooked shepherd boy that no one gave a chance to. In fact, in the next chapter, you know this story. We're going to see David stand up to a giant a giant of a man named Goliath who blasphemed the God of Israel, who mocked the God of Israel, who openly stood and called the Israelites out and said, you bunch of cowards, your God isn't real, he's not true. And they all cowered in fear until this young teenage boy, David, steps out toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath. And what does he use to kill Goliath? Is it his swordsmanship or his great military tact and skill? He takes a slingshot the common weapon of a shepherd boy. And he throws some stone and he hits Goliath right between the eyes and kills him. He didn't know that while he was simply tending sheep in the fields, God was preparing him for greater things. And furthermore, if David had not been faithful to do the little things in the field tending the sheep, he would not have been prepared to become the leader of God's people. Now, many times throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus spoke to his disciples about faithfulness in the kingdom and how faithful service in the kingdom begins with our willingness to do the little things, the out-of-the-way things, and when we show ourselves faithful in the little things, God raises us up to greater things. And he taught his disciples, not only with his words, but by example. Jesus would go out of his way to minister to those that everyone else overlooked. He would go to a blind man by the side of the road that hundreds, maybe thousands, had walked by in a day and would show no mercy to. Jesus would go out of his way for the little things. All the while, through his and by his obedience, Jesus learning what it means to be the perfect Messiah, the anointed one of God, to live in perfect obedience to him and to endure the perfect obedience of the cross. Can God count on you to be faithful in the little things that he's already set before you so that he can prepare you for greater things in the future? If you have a pencil or paper and you take notes, and I, I hope you do, just jot down in these next few moments, multitask, while I'm preaching, you jot down three or four things that you know in your life that you should be doing faithfully. And you might start with simple things. Praying. Reading my Bible on a day of the week that doesn't end in Sunday, you know. That isn't Sunday. Um, giving sacrificially to my church. Attending worship services. And serving in some simple capacity. I'm not even talking about anything. I'm just saying something simple. Right? Listen, we need nursery workers every week. We need godly, committed, patient, loving men and women who will sit with those wonderful little children so that their moms and dads can come up here and be ministered to. We need parking attendants, to help people to get from the parking lot into the church. We need greeters and ushers who stand back here and make people feel welcome the moment they walk through the door. We need people running that projector, don't we? We need people in the little things. But so often in the life of a church, we can't get people to step up to the little things. Those aren't important enough. We like the positions that have titles attached to them. We like the things that put us in the limelight. We like the things that elevate us. Do you remember James and John's mother going to Jesus? Hey, Jesus, would you take my boys and put them at your right hand and your left hand when you come into your kingdom? She wanted them to be exalted. 
Jesus said, it's not for me to determine. But he also said, I don't think they can endure the type of obedience that I'm going to endure. We like the idea of being exalted. We like the idea of God lifting us up and giving us responsibility and promoting us. But some of us have never learned faithfulness in the little things. Just run down that little list of Bible reading and, and prayer, daily Bible reading, day, daily prayer, uh, weekly attendance in church, faithful attendance in church, and, and sacrificial giving to the Lord and serving in some capacity. How many people are faithful to those little things? then don't be surprised if God hasn't opened new and bigger doors of opportunity and service to you. I have had through the years men and women who will come to me, people that I don't even see regularly in church, people that I don't see in Sunday school, people that don't participate in the life of the church, and almost out of the blue they'll come to me and say, well, I got something I want to say to the congregation. And I'm going to tell you, that never ends well. And I just say, no, that's not going to happen. You haven't even been faithful in these little things and yet you want to step up and do this position that you consider to be an exaltation. You want to tell everybody what's on your mind. But that's not how the kingdom of God works. If you would be first in the kingdom, you must be willing to make yourself last. Right? If you want to be exalted, what must you be willing to do? Be a servant of the lowest sort to others. And then in due time, God will exalt you. I'm thankful that I came to faith in Christ in a church that thought this way and that developed and raised up leaders this way. When I became a Christian in 1992 at my church, I came to faith in Christ. I was the only person in my family in that church. So it was like a church this big, maybe a little bigger, and I would come in and nobody knew me. I didn't have like an uncle or a dad that was a deacon. I didn't have a, a, an aunt or an uncle that ran, you know. I just kind of came in and sat. And, and I was odd. And it was strange. I was like, who is this kid, you know? And, and then I came forward and I got baptized in that church. And I immediately wanted to get busy serving Christ. And the first job, I can remember the first job that I was given was to run a camera. Because we had a television ministry too, you know. How did everybody in TV land? We had a television ministry, and I stood over there for months, and I operated this little camera. I had little headphones on, you know, and we'd talk, and we'd chuckle. And we would look for you guys that are, you know, doing this and snoozing. and so We'd make sure that we got you on public access, okay? Um, but I, I ran those cameras, and then I would tell my pastor, okay, I want something else to do. He said, well, we got this tape ministry. People call in and they, and they hear me preaching on the radio and they want copies of my tapes. Would you come in during the week and make tapes and send them to people and deliver them to widows and shut-ins? And I said, sure, I'll do that. So I started showing up one night a week and copying tapes. And it wasn't glorious work. Nobody knew I was doing it. My name wasn't in the bulletin anywhere. I didn't get any awards. I started copying tapes. Then my pastor starts saying, I want you to, to, to go with me to hospital visits. I want you to go with me to, to knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. And then they assigned me the task of preaching in the local nursing home over in Highland Heights. It's now dorms for NKU, but it used to be a nursing home. And I used to go there to this nursing home ministry, and I'll tell you just how wet behind the ears I was. I would show up in like a suit and a tie, and I'd have six pages of notes to preach from. And they'd wheel in seven or eight people that would slump over and fall asleep. And I'd stand up there and I'd just preach my heart out like I was preaching. Like I was Billy Graham, man. I was just doing it, you know. Nobody cared. <laughs> Get this over with, boy. And uh, it was through faithfulness to those little tasks that I began to discern that God had a unique calling on my life. And when I went to my pastor and explained to him that I felt like God was calling me to do ministry, and I didn't even know what it meant at that time. I didn't know all the language. I said, but God is calling me to do ministry. And he said something along the lines of, I've noticed that about you. Over the months, over the years, as my pastor, he had seen me growing and being faithful to these other things. And he knew he could entrust to me bigger things. And from there, God took me to Bible college, and it was at Bible college in a nursing home where I knew for sure, once for all, I sealed the deal. I knew God was calling me to preach the gospel, surrendered my life to it. Every day since then, I've not regretted 
yielding my life to Christ and serving Him with all of my heart. But if you're not faithful tending sheep, you're never going to know if God can raise you up and make you a leader of His people. If you're not telling your co-workers who Jesus Christ is, if you're not praying for family members when they're broken, if you're not visiting the sick and the poor, if you're not investing in the lives of others through discipleship where you're at now, what in the world makes you think you'll do that if God puts you in a leadership position? It never works that way. You can't put people in a position and then expect them to know how to serve. It, does, it never works that way. What you do instead is you look out among the congregation and find those who are servants and raise them up because they've been faithful in the little things. Don't minimize what God can do in your life right now where you're at. As you're discerning what is his plan, what is his purpose, where is he going to take me, what's he going to do in my life? Know that there is a plan. Prioritize your own sanctification, the development of your heart. Don't minimize how he can use you faithfully where you're at right now. Don't wait for the next big thing. Be faithful where you're at right now. And the last thing I'll show you from this passage is allow the Holy Spirit of God to energize you to energize you for service and faithfulness and holiness. See, all these things that we're talking about, prioritizing sanctification, being faithful in the little things, serving, it wouldn't be possible unless you were energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And do you see in this passage, when David is finally brought before Samuel, Samuel knows this is the one, the Lord speaks and says it's him, and Samuel takes that horn of oil, and look in verse 13, this is the symbol the oil is the symbol. By the way, that's why we still anoint people with oil. The oil doesn't do anything. The oil is the symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he takes this oil and he anoints young David. And this is important that you recognize this in verse 13. I think David was already what we would call a believer. Okay? I believe David already knew the covenant God of Israel, Yahweh, by this point. And when we come to know Jesus Christ in New Covenant language, when we are born again, we have, at the time of our rebirth, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come in spells and increments. You don't get a second and a third and a fourth blessing. Ephesians chapter 4 speaks of the fullness of the Spirit come and coming and filling us and sealing us. But what the Spirit does in verse 13 is He comes upon David in a unique way for this special task. So there is the infilling, the indwelling spirit who indwells us at the time of our regeneration, at the time of our salvation. The Holy Spirit moves in and takes up residence in our lives. But even those of us who have the spirit know that from time to time we have to pray, God, empower us, come over us in a powerful way. Lord, I'm going to go have lunch with somebody that hates the gospel and that resents the church, and I need your spirit to empower me in a special way. Or, Lord, I'm going on a missions trip to a very difficult place. I need your spirit to empower me in a special way. You're not asking for the spirit to move into your life. He's already there. But you're asking for the energizing, empowering presence of the spirit. And like the spirit came upon David from that day forward, I believe that if you're seeking the heart of God, if you're seeking to make the priority of your life, knowing Christ and making Christ known, sanctification is important to you. And you're being faithful in the little things that you're doing every day all around you. The Spirit of God is going to energize you for service and mobilize you, sending you forth into the harvest for the purpose of glorifying Christ and making disciples. Let me conclude this morning by asking some simple questions. Have you discerned a purpose and plan for your life that God has? And if not, what are you doing today so that you might know what God's plan for your life is? Let me ask you secondly, are you prioritizing sanctification? 
Does holiness still matter to you? It needs to matter to us, church. You know, the Bible says, without holiness, no man can see the Lord. Holiness is not just some church group out there that wears long skirts and puts their hair in a bun. That's not what it means. Holiness is the inward conformity of the heart to the image of Jesus Christ. And thank God we have friends out there who are committed to that. We need that kind of commitment in our churches as well. But are you being faithful? Are you being faithful? God's given you little tasks. He's put them before you every day. I can point you to a hundred different areas of ministry and service that we need right here at Williamstown Baptist Church. Will you be faithful in those little things? You don't have to be 50 or 60 or 70 years old before you start serving. If you desire something to do, come see me. Come see Brother Daryl. Come see your... Sunday school teacher, one of your deacons, and say, hey, I want to serve the Lord in some area. I promise we've got something for you to do around here to glorify Christ. And in the entire process, are you leaning fully upon and relying fully upon the energizing and mobilizing power of the Holy Spirit? For it is He alone who can energize you for this task. When these pieces are put in place in your life when they become priorities, when knowing the will of God and sanctification and faithfulness and service and reliance upon the Holy Spirit, when those things become your priority. You're no longer a traveler without a destination, without a plan, or without a route. No. You become a traveler that knows exactly where you're going and exactly where God is taking you. And you'll begin to know and understand exactly how he wants to take you there and what steps will be necessary for you to get from where you are to the vision that God has given you for where he wants to take you in your life. I'm going to ask you to bow with me this morning in prayer. As we bring our time together this morning to a close, some of you here may need to make decisions about your life. And I don't know what those decisions are. Some of the decisions might be public. You might want to share that. If, if you know that you're not saved, but you want to know how to be saved, just slip up here this morning and talk to me. Tell me about this. Let's get together. I'll show you from the scriptures what it means to trust Christ and follow him. If there's some sin in your life that's hindering you from following Christ, that's keeping you from knowing His will for your life, you don't have to come out publicly and do it. You can do it right where you're at. Just turn from that thing this morning and say, God, release me from the bondage of this so that I might know and obey your will for my life. Maybe it's a decision to perform some task or, or to be faithful in some ministry. Whatever it is where you're at this morning, I want to pray that God by His Spirit would move you to commitment. Father, in accordance with Your Word, I pray that Your Spirit would come upon us this morning in a heavy way and convict us of sin and draw us to the cross of Christ. I pray that someone here today who doesn't know Christ as Lord might step out and confess him or even step out and just admit their need that they, they don't know Christ, but they want him. Some others, perhaps publicly or maybe privately, may need to make decisions about their commitment, decisions that will strengthen our church and decisions which will send us forth into our community and into our world more mobilized for the Great Commission. So I pray for them. I pray for those important decisions. But Lord, right now, as we're singing, as we're inviting, I pray that your spirit would be at work. And if any are moved to come, that they would come to the glory of Christ. I pray in his name.